Oh, you work here. Oh, I'm not getting this is that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, oh, so I, yeah. one down and I got a word. You know what I have a free lunch? Yes. Yeah. 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 You just heard it. You boy and some others? Free lunch. It's true. Oh, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, you were over by the airport. I think when you were at United, you had one. That's right. Then I went to. Detroit and then Swartz Creek and then up to Midland. Yeah, I know. We found each other somewhere where you we were if not the next place on your uh, route. Or on your yes. 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 So how long? Did you go to Spring Arbor? I did. I graduated in 2010. Well, I grew up here, so. Oh, okay. I graduated in 2010. I want to ask you a question afterwards about paper. Right. If you have a moment, but if you're tied up, we'll. Oh, I should have a moment. Yeah. Good to see you. I don't have any. Yeah. Hey, they have. Hey, Aaron, they have a couple people. You still have that tape handy? Yes. Do you mind if I use some of it? I'm going to block off the back section. You know, I, I left Asbury. I mean, I left Asbury. Uh, six, yes. And I taught 10 years at Asbury. And Asbury has decided to retire, so I spent my time in writing. And then the last five years, I've been part time up at Tisdale. Actually, I saw that, yeah. But that's over. Oh, really? The West was here.
Hey Jack, can you when you guys stand right at the podium? Just stand right up there. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, no, thanks. I think I'd like to be closer. I can't zoom it. This it's just a webcam. I can't really zoom with it. Well, I bet you if I raise it up, I could get one real closer. Roger just wrote from Africa, watching you consult. He said, "Like he could just Roger Harlan just saw us talking apparently in Africa. Who Roger's a so." Yeah, this is a. Can you stand up there one more time? I think I'm good. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's a lot better. So, thanks.
Is it me or is it hot here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got her. Oh, you came over here just to No, I'm not. I'm here. But I just want to let you Yeah. Roger Burrell is watching in Africa right now. Probably criticizing how tall. Yeah, he's already criticizing the camera work. Look, it's a webcam, Roger. It's a webcam. Are you serious, Chris? Yeah. He really is. Seriously? Yeah. He said he saw it on the uh, MSFL Facebook page. Yeah, uh, sorry. Send me a Send me a Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Awesome. How you doing, man? How's it going? Good. Good. How's your school year going? Yeah, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I decided to blow myself up. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to announce that uh, if you would like to live tweet this event, which is what I assume all of your electronic devices will be out for, uh, hashtag S-A-U-C-O-L for community learners. So you can do that. Make sure that looks like Robbie Bolton will be live tweeting as well, our director of library. So thank you. I'm Dr. Jack Baker, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Dr. Howard Snyder has served as Distinguished Professor, Chair of Wesley Studies at Tyndale Seminary in Toronto, Canada, Professor of the History and Theology of Mission in the East Stanley Jones School of World Mission and Evangelism at Asbury Theological Seminary. He taught at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio, and pastored in Chicago, Detroit, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. Dr. Snyder was born in the Dominican Republic, where his parents, Edmund and Clara Snyder, served as Free Methodist missionaries. From the age of four, he grew up in Spring Arbor, Michigan. His father taught at Spring Arbor Junior College from 1944 to 1953. He is a graduate of Spring Arbor Junior College, Greenville College, and Asbury Theological Seminary. After graduating from Asbury Seminary, Dr. Snyder passed with the Detroit Redford Free Methodist Church for two years. He earned a doctorate in historical theology at the University of Notre Dame in 1983, completing a dissertation on church room movements under John Howard Yoder. From 1968 to 75, he served as pastor and seminary professor at Sao Paulo, Brazil, with the Free Methodist Church. 
Dr. Snyder has written or edited many books, including The Problem of Wineskins, 1975, The Community of the King, 1977, Concept and Commitment, A History of Spring Harbor University, important book for us, and Salvation Means Creation Theory, The Ecology of Sin and Grace, 2011. Owing to his lifelong investment in the health of Spring Harbor University, and given his deep commitment to the explication and serious study of the written and spoken word, it seemed fitting to have Dr. Snyder open this year's Community of Mother series with his lecture titled, The Place of the Land in God's Plan for Salvation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Snyder. Well, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. I, I'm not going to start reminiscing because if I did, I wouldn't get to other things. So, um, let's pray. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord, this time. We want to meditate this morning on, uh, on some scriptures, primarily, and uh, a few other things as we'll go along. And uh, I'm uh, basing my comments primarily on the uh, book, Salvation Means Creation Heal, which uh, I was pleased to hear since a, a classic Greenville College meeting this semester, and also a civic seminary. So uh, some people are beginning to find that that's encouraging. Um, uh, I'll be drawing on a few other things as well, but I'm going to be dealing primarily with some of the material that, um, that I deal with in the book. And the key question that I want to set up for us to think about this morning is, what is the nature of salvation according to Scripture? That's, that's really my overarching concern and uh, the topic, and, and particularly how that relates to the created order, or what is the relationship between God people and all creation in God's plan or economy or oikonomia, a biblical word from the New Testament, and also the Septuagint, um, for plan, uh, God's economy, God's plan of salvation. In other words, what is the relationship between God, people, earth, and heaven? Now, it would be quite productive for us to, for me to stop here and, and, and take the rest of the period for each of us to think about that. Uh, talk about it. Um, I'm not going to do that, but that, that would make sense. Uh, and I'm and speaking here of the relationship between God, people, earth, and heaven. What is the relationship actual, present, right now, as revealed in Scripture, by the way, and eschatological? In other words, what's going, what's it going to be? Where is it headed? What is God? up to the three guardrails. Now, as I reflected on this, <clears throat> thinking about my own formation, and I'm sure this is my own, you know, I wasn't exactly taught this, but this is sort of the way I came to understand, I think, what salvation was all about. Uh, that God created the earth, read in Genesis, uh, God created humans to inhabit the earth, which you also read in, uh, in Genesis, so the earth was is full of, of people and God's other creatures, and that God sent Jesus to save us so we can go to heaven. That's the part that, I, that I'm trying to sort of rethinking the more I uh, read and reread scripture. You know, I'll explain that. Uh, and that the final goal is eternal life with God in heaven, a kind of return to God. So there's kind of a logic coherence uh, to that. It's a, it's a story, it's a, it's a narrative. I, th I think you might, you might call this big W theology. It begins in heaven, earth, heaven. Uh, Jesus comes down from heaven to earth, takes back up heaven. And, and, uh, um, that may be a bit of a caricature, but I really, it, it faithfully represents, I think, the way I can see uh, salvation. But I um, have been asking myself, what is the biblical picture with regard to this? In other words, what does the Bible teach about God? People and the land, just as a reminder. In the in the Bible, heaven and earth usually mean the whole created order, not two different incompatible realities. What I argue in the book is that what uh, the Bible holds together, uh, humans and history of suffering, <clears throat> that is uh, the oneness of uh, 
and that they're God's intention for the created order and what that means. And uh, the usually the phrase is very typical of it, the kind of people way of thinking and speaking. Usually in scripture the phrase heaven and earth means the whole thing, the whole created order. Now, the Bible is actually the story of God and people and land. All you have to do is trace the references to land, land and earth being the same word in Hebrew, it's also in Greek. Uh, it is traced that through scripture and, and we see that the story of God, the story of salvation, is the story of God and people and land. Now there are many examples of this. I'm going to, uh, to just take one verse here in Deuteronomy 8.10. If you remember uh, the story of Deuteronomy, uh, the uh, people of Israel are about to enter the promised land and Moses is preparing them for their time there and warning them over and over again, remember what has God has done, and remember the covenant, be faithful to what you have been taught. And this is, is uh, given in such a succinct way, I think, here in Deuteronomy 8.10. <clears throat> this injunction, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Now, if we, if we analyze that very simple sentence, we see that it is a phrase about God and the people on the land. And in particular, the logic of the verse here, God gives the land, the land nourishes the people, the people are to praise God. But just as a hint, where are we going? There's nothing in Scripture that suggests that that somehow was only for them there. It doesn't continue for all a few times at a time for all human history. Uh, God gives the land, the land nourishes the people, the people praise God. And so that's uh, the, the first part is certainly still true. That God gives the land, the land which is people, but the people praise God is another issue. Now, we can reverse the arrows if we, if we look more broadly in the scripture and, and see how all this fits in the larger picture, and that is that God calls and blesses the people, the people of Israel here. They are, in turn, to enjoy the land and to care for the land. Old Testament about caring for the land as well as enjoying the benefit from, from it. <clears throat> and the land glorifies God. Now, we may not think of that so much, but read Psalms or read Job or many other places in Scripture where it talks about the whole creation praising God. Uh, Isaiah, elsewhere, uh, the land glorifies God. So, it's a, again, it's a, it's a logical, coherent uh, picture, and since the arrows go go both ways, but really it's this picture of shalom, that rich, biblical word, shalom, which is what the New Testament writers had in mind, it means peace, but it means more than absence of conflict, it means flourishing, it means proper relationship, reconciliation, probably the best way of saying it, shalom means proper relationship. So what God intends is a proper relationship, a relationship of shalom, and uh, to use a new word, a shalomistic relationship between God and people and the land. Now, this is what God sets up by covenant with the children of Israel. But God reminds the people over and over again, yes, I, you know, I've chosen you, but I'm not just the God of Israel, I am the God of all nations. That, that hint just comes through all the way through in the first chapters of Genesis, and then the very strong in the prophets, where constantly, when God calls and the prophets call Israel to account for um, faithfulness to the fidelity of the covenant, he reminds them, I'm the God, not just of Israel, but the God of all of Israel. And as the prophets develop that further, and we move further through the Old Testament, we see that God is not only the God of Israel, he's the God of all nations, He's not only the God of the land of Israel, but the whole earth. So there's a sense in which the whole earth is holy land. And God is not only the God of the people of Israel, but all peoples and nations. And so, of course, the prophets talk about this, and already it's in Psalms and other places. Hence, it in various, various places throughout the Old Testament, more places it becomes explicit that God intends, He's chosen Israel to benefit all the nations and all the land. So that. When Jesus teaches, and when the New Testament writers write, this is in their mind. I mean, this is a world that they've grown up with, and what, what certainly Jesus learned from uh, his own formation. And so, 
the New Testament gives us this marvelous picture of salvation, reconciliation through Jesus Christ, by which all of this study is intended in the Old Testament, the proper relationship between God and the people and the land is to be fulfilled, is fulfilled through the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ongoing reign of Jesus Christ. So it is the Trinity, the Lord of all creation, we learn in the New Testament, more about the meaning of this God of the Old Testament, uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bringing reconciliation, the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ, that is intended for all peoples and nations and all creation to bring everything together under one head, even Jesus Christ, as we have in Ephesians 1.10. And so this clearly is behind Jesus' prayer. May your kingdom come, the Lord's Prayer, and part of that, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as in heaven. And Jesus tells us to pray that. It hit me one day, I don't think Jesus would ask us to pray that if we didn't intend to answer the prayer. That God's will should be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the question is, how does that come about, and how do we understand that in terms of God's work through Jesus Christ and the Spirit? Through the church. But this is literally the whole gospel for the whole world. It's not the whole gospel for the whole world, it's the earth, obviously, because that's all part of, of God's created plan. So the whole gospel for, for the whole world, the foundation of holistic mission, the mission, the foundation for discipleship, because how we relate to God, how we relate to the earth is by definition fundamental to our discipleship. And the foundation of uh, discipleship that is faithful to God's covenant. So we're dealing behind this uh, very much with the question of uh, the covenant, um, God's covenant with the earth. And we're going to talk about that Sunday in the Sunday School class. I've been doing uh, two Sundays, the final one this Sunday. Um, uh, we were looking last time specifically at that matter of God's covenant with the earth, which is a fundamental teaching of, uh, of the Old Testament. Now, if you put all this together, what you see that it is if the land is left out of the biblical equation, the story of salvation does not add up in a way that is consistent with Scripture. So the question is, how do we um, bring the various the many teachings of Scripture about not only about people, but about the land, and the land becomes uh, almost symbolic of whole creation in fact, uh, into our understanding of salvation. Okay, now, the key determining fact in accomplishing God's plan is what? What is the key to all this? Well, the New Testament is very clear, isn't it? Jesus Christ. And note, what the Bible says, what the New Testament says about Jesus Christ, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making shalom and peace through the blood of his cross. Paul could not have used the word peace without shalom being in the back of his mind. Um, the reconciliation of all things. And Paul in other passages says, I mean, he's, he's very emphatic, isn't he? All things, things in heaven, things on earth, things past, things present, things to come. Um, the, the, the fullness of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. In other words, the wonder, the power of the meaning of reconciliation through Jesus Christ. And of course, that comes to such power, powerful demonstration in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This doesn't actually have to be the picture of the resurrection, it has to be the picture of the last judgment, but I like this, this image of Christ because of the power that it suggests in accomplishing God's purposes. Now, this is Michelangelo, I'm sure somebody from Africa or Latin America or China might paint this a little differently, but you get the point. The resurrection, the resurrection of, uh, of Jesus Christ and all that that means. We, again, we can spend the rest of the time looking at Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 in the light of, of all of this, and we would, we would see a lot that would be helpful to us. But I look at some of the things that the Scripture said, and then Jesus himself says, he says, look at my hands and my feet, see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, it's bones, as you see, 
that I have. I wonder sometimes if you think of Jesus more as a ghost or a disembodied uh, spirit or something, rather than uh, the uh, literal, physical, risen Christ that is pictured for us in the Scripture. Or Luke 24, 41, while in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of royal fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Now, I can, I can sort of picture here, Jesus said, is this real? Who is this? You know, and uh, so, you know, Jesus says, well, how about, you know, got anything to eat? A little bit of humor there, I think. But it's a way of his, uh, his making uh, the point to them. This is, I am not a ghost, he says. That's what Or Hebrews. 2, 14, and 15, which makes the next connection with us. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, as we are, he himself likewise shared the same thing, flesh and blood, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. Now, notice it doesn't say the plan of God is not to destroy the earth, but destroy the devil, destroy the works of the devil. So, the point is, for us, whatever happened to Jesus in the resurrection, the same thing will happen to us. We shall be like him until we shall see him as he is. And the same thing will, will happen to the whole creation. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the model, the power, the example, and the pointer to the future. If we are to be raised the same way Jesus was, physically, we may expect the same thing out of the whole created order, the whole promise of the new heaven, the new earth. Or 1 John 3, 2, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And that's why I suggest that salvation means creation healed. The very word salvation in English is related to the word for healing, and that's true also in the biblical language. It's very much related to the salvation as the healing of the disease of sin. Paul especially speaks of that in Romans 8, in Romans 8, 21. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Whatever happened to Jesus is what will happen to us and what will happen to the created order. We'll be set free. Peter, in his sermon in Acts 3, he says Jesus must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Incidentally, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the favorite verses of John Wesley uh, in King James says, the restitution of all things. We would say today, restoration. And uh, uh, John Wesley emphasized that, the restitution of all things. In other words, put all this together, God intends to redeem people with their environment, not out of their environment. So, salvation means creation healed. This means that in the Bible, the direction of salvation is not up to heaven, but down to earth. Or rather, the marriage of heaven and earth. The new heavens and the new earth, and all that all the scripture promises with regard to that throughout all the books of the Bible. So, what is our future? Is it this? Is this our future, or Joachim of Fiora, back to all the time of Francis of Assisi, thought it was like this, and yet he ate this uh, age of the Father, age of the Son, age of the Holy Spirit, and now uh, Francis of Assisi, the Franciscans, this whole big renewal movement was coming, he says, this is the new age of the Spirit. Or is it this, which is really a picture of Isaiah 11? by the Quaker uh, painter Edward Hicks in Pennsylvania. He, drew, he painted several versions of this, and if, if, if you look and study it, you see he's, he's brought in all, practically all the elements there of, of uh, Romans, uh, I mean, uh, Isaiah 11. Now, I'm, I'm going to do just a little uh, um, detour here, uh, to, just to suggest that this whole way of uh, what I'm looking, about, looking at this morning, that John Wesley was attuned to this. In, in England in the 1700s. And we see this especially 
in the um, in this uh, series of sermons in, that he wrote when he was in his 80s, looking back at the 50 years or so of ministry. And um, uh, there's been a tendency for the past about 20 years or so to talk about the Western project. I don't turn the Western interviews, but but on the other hand, it does bring on key insight that Western scripture, reason, tradition, and experience developing the anything and triad of, of, of reason, tradition, and, um, uh, and scripture. Um, uh, but if you if you actually study Western sermons, you see he's constantly talking about the created order. And he was so concerned about this, he wrote a published a four volume book. Uh, called from other authors, called The Wisdom of God and Creation. And so really what we have in, uh, in Wesley is not uh, uh, the traditional quadrilateral, rather in the scripture at the center. Wesley's very clear about that. But then bringing in not only tradition, experience, and reason, but also creation as a way of understanding the fullness of God. Wesley believed, like John Edwards and many others, that there are two books. There's the book of scripture and the book of nature, and we should pay attention to uh, to both, and uh, not to care for uh, for the book of nature or the created order, it's like looking pages out of the Bible. Now, if you, if you look at Wesley, you see that he was drawing on both the Eastern and the Western tradition. Both people like Ephraim and Sirius, and Macarians, um, Quinn and the Cappadocians, and so on. So he's very much interested in that, uh, that emphasis on the image of God, on uh, the power of the Spirit, the Christian perfection. Or perfecting and so on, but it's also interested in the fact of uh, sin and violation of God's law, grace, and need to, uh, to overcome that. Unless they bring those two together, those two traditions together, and marries them in a very creative way. So that what we uh, what we see is the prepare the plan of salvation <clears throat> in these two traditions are somewhat different. In the Western tradition is basically a creation called redemption, which is true, it's biblical, but it may underplay. The doctrines of creation and incarnation, which of course are so strongly emphasized in Eastern tradition, the Orthodox churches, for example. And the Eastern tradition, it's more creation, incarnation, and new creation. In the Eastern tradition, the incarnation is actually the beginning of redemption. Because Jesus Christ in his incarnation assumes, takes on the physical world, which is then that the subject of, of and the object of uh, Jesus' new work of new creation. This is true, it's biblical, but this may underplay the doctrines of sin and social justice. I think Wesley got a remarkable insight in bringing those two together. And so, the Wesley's way of understanding, it is creation, the fall of restoration, healing. <clears throat> uh, creation, especially the answer some image of God, the fall, partial loss of the image, and the restoration of uh, healing, restoration of the image of God, the image of God. Jesus Christ. So Western theology drawing in scripture and both the Eastern and Western traditions is comprehensive and holistic in that sense. So uh, you can go and sit under the kind of tower and meditate. I'm not just going to cut your light on these points, but uh, that's the end of the detour. Now, the, the question is, how did the church ever come to see the promised land of the Old Testament as heaven? It's really puzzling to stop to think about it. And yet, how many Psalms do we have in which being bound for the promised land means going to heaven. It's a, it's a conundrum. It, it's really a strange idea when you stop and think about it. And I, I actually, I, I puzzled about that, and I thought, well, it was this or that. Um, I finally decided it was uh, complex. <laughs> there, there are several things. What are the sources of this massive misunderstanding, this unbiblical divorce of heaven and earth? And I, I uh, found Identify what I think are some uh, likely culprits, and uh, each one of these would be the subject of uh, a lecture, I suppose. Philosophical dualism, second and third centuries, although we already find the early church dealing with it in uh, Gnosticism, and so on, we get into that already. Uh, but spirit is good, matter is bad. And so obviously, the key is to get from, from, from the material existence to spiritual existence. Happens not to be what the Bible teaches, but that, that, has, that has had a strong influence. Then Constantinianism in the fourth and fifth centuries, which uh, introduced and reinforced the idea of a secular, sacred split, which is not exactly what, what the Bible has in mind either, but it tended uh, to further uh, lead toward the uh, divorce of heaven and earth, 
than medieval mysticism, a lot of good in medieval mysticism, we still read a lot of good things, but a lot of a lot of the medieval mysticism is about the getting away from the material to dwell in the spiritual rather than holding the two together. And then enlightenment rationalism, which tends to split religion from science and um, experience from reason and so on, and that has had its effect as well. And then in the 19th and 20th centuries, premillennial dispensationalism, thinking about John Nelson Darby, the Swift of the Reference Bible, and so on, uh, beginning uh, in terms of Darby and uh, George Mueller and others who came to the States and taught this and became a new thing, new theology, and new fact. Um, but it's not biblical. Uh, the premillennial dispensationalism, which divides up history in a way that uh, the scripture does not. Now, it's helpful to remember, this is something that John Weston never heard of, Martin Luther never heard of, John Calvin never heard of, Augustine never heard of, Thomas Aquinas never heard of. It was a new theology that, that was invented uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the 1800s. Now, there are, there are hints of it earlier in history. But, but yet, yeah, it, it, it has become so popular today that, for example, in my denomination, the Free Methodist Church, Many people don't realize this is not Western theology. This is not what we were, uh, you know, what what our what our uh, what, what B.T. Roberts who got on Wesley uh, they never heard of. In fact, John Wesley I mean, Roberts warned against an over preoccupation with money and theories. Now these seven things that I highlighted as possible culprits are cumulative, that is they add up. I think the last premillennial dispensationalism has done the most harm in the 20th century, but they, I don't think that would happen if it hadn't been for those earlier things. Now, put this together, I would identify some symptoms. This whole issue of the earth and the, the land and God's creation, what I would call symptoms of an unbiblical view of heaven and earth and by extension of, of uh, salvation. First would be, of course, equating salvation with going to heaven. Actually, there's a, a check in scripture, there's a whole lot more about the new heaven and the new earth than there is about going to heaven. Secondly, the failure to see the links between spiritual, physical, and environmental well-being. There's a, there's a fundamental ecological understanding of the scripture in, in a biblical revealed sense. Third, failure to see creation care as essential not somewhere down the line, but it's essential to Christian discipleship. For example, indifference toward recycling, gasoline consumption, whatever it might be. And then fourth, failure to distinguish between biblical, gospel, and conservative politics. Yes, I know there are those who fail to distinguish the gospel between the gospel and, and liberal politics, but uh, most of the places I go, that's not the issue. In other words, the, the plan of salvation is not raptured by healing, restoration. For example, in this uh, in this verse, uh, which has been misinterpreted in uh, much millennial millennial theology, one shall be taken and the other left. Well, I always thought that one going to be taken to heaven and the other left on the earth. But if you look at the context of like Noah and the flood and so on, uh, one shall be taken away to judgment. That place of judgment outside the city, the place of burning, and the other left to enjoy the new heaven and new earth in praise to God as Jesus returns and makes all things new. So, what is the roadmap then in terms of our understanding of salvation? Well, the biblical plan of salvation implies, I'm going to use this term eschatological contingency. That's a complicated, complicated term, about, but, uh, but it captures what I what I have in mind. Let's get to logic in terms of where is history had a contingency in the sense that it's not all predetermined. You can't. The, the minute you map out everything that's going to happen in the future, you're wrong. Because the, um, the Bible leaves a lot of things open. That is, the, an open future under God's sovereignty. Now, if we look at Scripture, what we see is that what is sure and determined is the character and promises of God. No question there. God is sovereign, he's eternal, he will work out his purposes, his character does not change, and yet, through history, God has made adaptations to human behavior, and his promises do not change. 
and we have that certainty. What is not sure and determined is the precise course of history. How all God's promises, how all God's promises will be fulfilled, how they will be fulfilled, I would argue, is not predetermined. And, and I base that on not on scripture, the two ways. Which runs all the way through uh, through scripture after um, after the fall. The two ways. God creates covenant with his people and says, okay, now you've got you, know, you can either follow in fidelity or you can uh, follow in uh, you can fail to follow you can, you can be unfaithful to the covenant. And there are consequences. And of course Deuteronomy spells that out in uh, in detail. And then that gets picked up throughout scripture. Joshua as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. What are you going to do? Uh, Jeremiah 21 8, Psalm 1 6, Proverbs 4 14, and a whole lot of other scriptures. Uh, most uh, pointedly, perhaps, is Deuteronomy 30 19 and 20, where the two ways of this set up out with total clarity. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Remember the two mountains with the buses and curses. Choose life. This is God's word constantly. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So the two ways are very much connected with what God is doing with people and what God is doing with the land. Um, find this in the New Testament. So Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, he answers the Sermon on the Mount, talking about the two ways. You may have heard learn in Sunday school about a song about the wise man built his house one way and the foolish man um, another. But all the way through uh, through scripture, the uh, the two ways are set out before us. So we are left, and what I'm suggesting is this doesn't just refer to our own individual uh, salvation, although it certainly includes that, but it, it has to do with God's whole purposes of working out the plan of salvation. So what we're left with is eschatological contingency, that is, it's not all predetermined, uh, even though God can sovereignly fulfill all of his promises. Secondly, hope in the midst of uncertainty, because of the promises of God, because of the power of salvation in Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, and therefore, responsibility. By definition, grace in the New Testament makes us responsible. This is one of the um, main emphasis of John Wesley. Responsible grace. Grace makes us be uh, responsible. And then the key challenge of faith in God's promises. Do we believe God's promises or do we not? If we believe that God is powerful enough to save and to send, is God powerful enough to bring a new heaven and a new earth? And to use me in whatever way God intends, now as a part of that trajectory. And then, so, covenant, obedience, and faithfulness. And this is promised over and over again in the scripture. And uh, again, Wesley picks up on this in some, some of those sermons for the New, the new Creation, the Jealous Spread of the Gospel, and the Eternal Deliverance, and so on. Um, Isaiah 11, 9, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Again, God intends to be people with their environment, not out of their environment. So, what the Bible seems to point at, we look at some of the promises of uh, new creation, something looks a little more like, uh, you know, maybe something like this, or, or maybe something like this, or maybe something like this, uh, or maybe something, I, I did that's wrong, I did that. So he arose. This is the fact. Jesus Christ, who lived, who was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, lived physical life, died on the cross, rose again, and is now reigning and working through this church by the Spirit to bring this kingdom of fullness. God's will done on earth as it is in heaven will fulfill all of his promises. The earth shall. Be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so, our prayer is we end here. You know, the Lord's prayer may God's kingdom come, may your, this will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Psalm 104 O Lord, how manifold are your works! 
and in wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. So we have a bit of time for uh, some question and answer discussion, whatever. So very um, good one. say amen, amen, amen at various points, but I'm not enough of a free Methodist to do that, I'm sorry. It's marvelous. What I wonder is, who, who could oppose this? I mean, what you're saying is, is obviously so biblical. Um, who's going to stand up and say, no, I disagree with this? Um, it may be some you know, 19th century pre-millennialist, but who's around now that's going to that's gonna say you're wrong? Well, first of all, there's a whole lot of 19th century uh, free blindness in our churches. Uh, I run into them all the time. You know, it, it, for example, well, if it's all going to bring up money, we need to take care of the environment, and that's one. And if that's the case, what difference does it make if uh, we pollute, you know, or if we aren't concerned uh, about the fact that the more um, we pollute in North America or increasingly in China, the more we are probably Increasing probability of poor people in Bangladesh and other people in places in the United States. So I, I think uh, I, I, I think that's a very good question, and uh, I think I think the short answer to that is that's looking at the scripture, and I think the more we look at scripture and read it on its own terms, we will um, we will see exactly this effect. Other. Uh, I echo a check on this. I hope that uh, somehow the PowerPoint's available to us. Team knows like crazy in the beginning to get down there and want to get down. Uh, I was born a Quaker. I remain a Quaker by convincement. Your picture raises uh, a lot of uh, feelings, including the feeling in the background is William Penn with the Indians, whom he deprived of their kingdom, their peaceful kingdom, so that he could substitute his peaceful kingdom. And we're caught up in the contingencies of the current world as we as we try to uh, to work with the thought and achievement of this kingdom on earth. Um, the picture really looks very utopian to me at this point. Um, I, I think we we operate so much, uh, including myself, with this um, dualistic man, uh, mindset that. Uh, we talk about spiritual formation, we talk about spiritual things, we talk about earthly things. I mean, I picked up the spiritual formation Bible, which is wonderful, but for Romans 8, nothing at all about the creator or the creation here, which is certainly expect to find. But what that says is, we have defined spiritual formations having nothing to do with the earth. Isn't how we care for the earth just as important as prayer and Bible study and witnessing? It isn't part of fact part of our witness. So I, I, think, uh, I think that. Uh, that dualism operates, that their dualism in the sense of uh, matter is, if not evil, it's bad or something to be denied, uh, and spirit is good, and so the whole direction of uh, salvation should somehow be from the material and spiritual, rather than the biblical picture of all things reconciled in Jesus Christ, which is pretty dramatic and pretty um, amazing, really. Um, so amazing that it's 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 easy to uh, to not take it to not see it or not take it seriously. And I think uh, some of the early Quakers were very much attuned to some of this. And we're thankful, I think, for the witness. Okay, other comments, questions? Just to follow up with Dr. Ross's question, we will have the PowerPoint available along with the video. I was just wondering. Um, what do you think Jesus is, is, is saying to us in the Olivet Discourse and the Book of Revelation, given this framework? Um, do you have something more specific in mind? Or no? Well, uh, the, book, uh, uh, the Book of Revelation um, um, 
it's, it's explicit in the first verses of Revelation 1. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not a revelation of the roadmap of everything that's going to happen in the future. It's a revelation of, uh, given to encourage the Christians who many of are being persecuted to hold fast to Jesus Christ because he is the one that will bring all things to a full recognition and uh, like the, uh, the new heaven and the new earth is here will come through much suffering and, and so on. Um, and uh, the holy city will come to earth. Uh, God's kingdom will be will come in, uh, in its fullness. So I think um, you know, I think that's what Jesus was saying. Um, or that's what it is. I think that's what the book of Revelation is saying. And I think I think the same thing throughout uh, throughout Jesus' teaching too. Yeah. <clears throat> Jay, can you give us examples of places where you see uh, believers helping to restore the creation where it is being healed on the earth? Well, there are a number of churches that are uh, very great. Uh, you know, uh, we're familiar, I suppose, here with all the problems that are going on in Detroit. There are some Christians and others working there to uh, bring in urban farming to you know, various things. There are some churches. In Africa, which have uh, what they call a seed, uh, excuse me, tree plant um, Eucharist, where they plant trees as a part of it. A few things more prophetic than planting a tree. Um, um, and uh, I think I think uh, more and more uh, churches are uh, are beginning to see, oh, okay, this this is a part of the discipleship. And uh, the uh, Evangelical Environmental Network. Um, has some very good material on that in the magazine Creation Care and their website and various things. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of really good things. There's, there's a curriculum available now. Um, a lot of really good things uh, happening, I think. And um, it's, it's part of the larger issue of church renewal, I think. And um, uh, if God's intent is to renew the face of the earth um, and, and renew people and renew churches, it's all uh, one. Uh, peace, one package, and they reinforce each other. Yeah, Jim. Uh, having to deal with any other specific scriptures also to bring to your own. Yes. Hey, Dr. Snyder, so this is a pretty basic question, but um, I guess as you know, people are trying to figure out how you flesh this out in your own life, right. um, creation care, and things like that. Um, I think the pendulum always swings, and some people you know, wonder how do I actually apply this. So, I guess just commenting on what your approach would be to, uh, say, hunting for sport rather than for food. Um, I guess the balance of caring for creation, but you know, can you have a car? Is that that? Because I think that's the, what some people might struggle with. How do you know? Yeah, well, I, like. yeah I, I think. I, I think my main purpose here is to raise um, issues of consciousness and conscience, and so people ask that question, and then we need to answer it for itself. Now, in our case, it makes sense to grab a Prius rather than, a, than, a, than a, you know, a total gas consumption. But we're still polluting, it's not as much. You know. uh, so we walk as much as, uh, as, much as we can. Um, obviously, we cycle, you know, I, um, I carry uh, a mug with me for coffee. But Styrofoam. Whenever I see styrofoam, I say, okay, um, they haven't got it yet. You know? um, and, and similarly, I'll go down the line, but certainly the whole, the whole really, I think the main point is to this integration of the spiritual material. So, uh, you know, prayer is part of it. I have my prayer list, one of the things we go to. Um, not only missions, but the creation. Um, Care mandate. I'm just, I, I certainly pray for Steve Pitch and even use restoration ministries. You know, free money is starting. Even restoration. And uh, I was I was in uh, old Katy Province University outside Port of Prince in May. Glad to see that they're not as part of the program. They're planted, they planted about 10,000 seedlings. So of course you probably know deforestation is a huge issue. 97 percent deforested in um, in Haiti across the across the line in the Dominican Republic where I was born to see the difference. Um, so I, I think I, one thing I would say about that is uh, think of a continuum all the way from what I do with my time and money day by day, very personal. Time, money, devotions, prayer, that kind of thing, all, all the way up to global issues. 
because they're all interconnected. You know, there's a biblical, ecological understanding which says that uh, everything is connected to everything else. You know, one of the main, uh, one of the classic statements from an ecological perspective is you can never do just one thing. You're always doing several things at the same time. And there are cycles of death and cycles of life, which are contributing to or contributing to both, but that's as much as possible to contribute to the cycle of life. Uh, and the you know, idea was something that in the book. So I think, and there's plenty of good resources now on that. Uh, Ed Brown has a book called uh, uh, Our Father's World, a lot of practical things, and there's many others as well. Although, uh, 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 if I draw a list, the top, very top of the Bible is radical on this subject. I'm for a few more. Um, how do you interpret like uh, Second Peter three where it talks about the fire consuming the um, and also how do you answer people who say, Well Jesus is just gonna redeem everything when he comes back, so why does it really matter what we get now Yeah. Well the answer to the second part is uh, that Jesus is going to redeem everything why when he comes back, so why should we deal with personal advantages? It's the same question. Uh, that passage in Second Peter, two things I would say about that. One is, if you look at the two ways, uh, this is very helpful to me, by the way, to see this description. If you look at the two ways, you'll find you can pile up the scriptures that deal with destruction and judgment. You can pile up the scriptures that deal with new life, restoration, and so on. There are, the Old Testament prophets are constantly back to the court of being. What's the point then? Well, there's a choice. There's two ways. It could be this or it could be that. Uh, that, so that's one thing. And that particular passage says, uh, and it's true of other similar passages, it says, remember what happened under Noah, the time of the flood. And it says, um, the people disregarded until the water came, and it says the world was destroyed. Well, actually, the world was destroyed in one sense, in the flood, but not in another sense, right? It wasn't fully destroyed because of God's grace, similar to Paul. Uh, with, uh, with Adam and Eve. So I think that I think that comes into play. That there is um, this sense of uh, oh, and the, the other thing I would say about that uh, passage is, by the way, uh, here's one point for Calvin and must agree. Uh, the, the the reference to fire in that passage should be interpreted in terms of the Old Testament, where fire is always usually used in terms of uh, a refining, you know, clear cleansing out. Rather than destruction, so the, the destruction in a sense. Uh, John Wesley says uh, on one of those verses says annihilation is not restoration, um, and uh, so uh, I think that helps as well. Uh, there are many passages throughout Scripture that talk about fire being used to cleanse, to burn, to renew, to, to burn out the impurities, but to bring uh, bring forth the gold. So I think I think that's the way I would interpret that. Good time for one more. Um, obviously, this interpretation of scripture being within the right Christian thought, how do you combat, or not necessarily combat, uh, kind of work with uh, the philosophies of, say, you know, the Greek philosophy of Adam and Dad, uh, or East, a lot of Eastern thought, where the whole attempt is to separate oneself from the Outside the world, and to just come at peace. How do you do you work with the, those philosophies in terms of missions? Um, I like the phrase that uh, Leslie Newbigin uses. And he said we should learn how to inhabit the worldview of scripture, um, which takes <laughs> takes some uh, That Greek dualism is not the Old Testament understanding, and we tend to read that. And, and since it's not the Old Testament understanding, it's not the New Testament understanding either. But again, we tend to uh, read that back in. So I think uh, I think the, the, the way to do that is just to immerse ourselves in Scripture and Christian community and prayer and Bible study, um, uh, glory in the uh, beauty of God's world, realizes that God has this attested in nature, it speaks us, uh, through us, to us through two books, and they're not in contradiction. Um, and uh, but of course, the scripture is essential to a, a proper interpretation um, of nature. Uh, but God uses both, and uh, so um, it, it's all about personal uh, discipleship and community and uh, prayer and meditation and uh, 
and uh, uh, glorying in God's revelation in Scripture and in nature. Some of you may have seen the book uh, Lost the Last Last Child in the Woods by the person Lado and he talks about nature deficit disorder. And he says actually not just emotionally, physically, human beings are malformed if they don't have contact with the natural world in an unprogrammed, so not not talking about really sports, I'm talking about an unprogrammed involvement with the beauty of nature. We are programmed to need that, and we are physically, emotionally, neurologically harmed if we don't have it. So, doesn't that say something about what we as Christians should be doing with, uh, with our own lives, with the property we have responsibility for, for uh, you know, every every church building, the property that it owns, ought to be a demonstration project, uh, demonstration, yeah, uh, a model of creation healed in some way. So it makes a difference what lives there, what creatures, what flowers, how we take care of them, what we do with pests, all that. I, I, I know that raises a lot of questions, but um, the other side raises just as much, maybe more, and it's death dealing. This is life dealing. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Snyder? He'll be around for a few more minutes. Thank you.